Uh, hello, thank you for coming here today. Um, my name is Tony Priori. I am a senior here at Robert Morris, majoring in early childhood education and special education. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about dyslexia and about how it's generalized as just a reading disability, but it's much more than that. It actually affects the people who have this disability's lives throughout their entire um, time. Now, let's talk about experiencing this impairment. A lot of people associate when they hear the word dyslexia that it, it involves a reading disability, maybe writing disabilities. It might also affect their speech. But the main portion that people would ascribe to you when you ask them what it's like to try to read or to try to write, they will describe that they'll see letters either be upside down, maybe they're out of order, they might be jumbled up or spread out. So that above picture that I have there, that would be an example of someone who could describe themselves as viewing a sentence that way. It's definitely readable, but it would take you a long time to decipher just a word at a time in comparison to understanding what the um, sentence is trying to portray. Another most common description is that as people are trying to read a sentence or a word or a phrase, they will describe it as um, floating or moving text. They might feel dizzy, maybe even nauseous. So could you imagine yourself if it looked like the lower picture for you to read a novel or an assignment like an essay to have to type and to, to view something in that way? I definitely would struggle and not want to do that. The main portion of my research paper that I wrote about dyslexia focused on the brain itself that accompanies the impairments of dyslexia. Now, this helps explain why it is such a big struggle for people to learn how to read and write and speak and even do mathematics. Um, this part of the brain is misfunctioning. It's, it has impairments that are within that section of the brain. It's called the planum temporal. It's located in the front part of your brain. And depending on if you're right-handed or left-handed, that's the side of the hemisphere that it's located in your brain. And I have an image to help us view this. Um, but it's in, its main job is to receive, interpret, and comprehend language. Um, and as I said, it's located in the dominant hemisphere. So if we look at the image, it's hard to tell the colors. But the red images are this planum temporal. The above is a person who does not have the impairment of dyslexia. As you can see, it's smaller and it's on one side. This person would be a left-handed person. But below, that's a person that does have dyslexia. Their planum temporal is much larger, almost inflamed, and it's found on both sides of the brain, which causes that big confusion, the overlap of information, and the disconnect when they're trying to interpret and receive information. And as you all are listening to me right now, someone with dyslexia would have a very hard time deciphering um, one word that might come out of my mouth instead of my entire speech overall. The second part of the brain that I also talked about um, that is greatly impacted by dyslexia is called the angular gyrus. This part of the brain is in the upper rear section of the occipital lobe. That's just a fancy word for saying the back of your head, kind of where the crown of your head is located. Um, and it's most notable for having um, a major effect from this disability because the cells itself in the brain are formed differently. It almost looks in CAT scans and MRIs, it almost looks like it's deformed. The cells might look more dense, they might be an irregular shape, um, definitely not as uniform as a person who does not have dyslexia. The main job for the angular gyrus is to translate um, the commonly seen words in our world. And as education majors, we call those high frequency words or environmental text. They're the words that you can see on a logo, um, commonly used words in a sentence. Think about way back when you were all in elementary school and you were learning your vocabulary words. A lot of those vocabulary words are high frequency words like can, the, we, they. Those are all words that can get stored into this memory in the back of your brain, almost like a library. Someone who has dyslexia, they cannot do this. 
that memory storage just is almost non-existent. There might be a, a little bit of, of memorization that happens, but it definitely takes an, a very long amount of time to build on that. A quote that I had from my research paper that I really feel um, explains this part of the brain clearly, it's from the Society of Neuroscience. It says, recent studies of a variety of reading and language tasks in dyslexic individuals showed less activity in the angular gyrus than those without the disability. So basically, as everyone's trying to memorize those vocabulary words, those high frequency words, there's lots of activity going on and if you view it um, at, in a CAT scan or an MRI, it's almost like little lights are flickering off, like your brain's really busy. In a person without dyslexia, or in a person with dyslexia's brain, there's less light, less movements going on because there's no memory storage happening. The part of the angular, angular gyrus of the brain that I'm speaking of is the green section. It's kind of hard to see because it blends in with the blue section, but that was just another portion of the brain that I didn't need, but this image also put it in there. So the green part of your brain, as I said, it's towards the crown, and if you look at someone who does not have dyslexia, this image um, shows that the green portion, your angular gyrus, is located on the left side. It will always be on your left side. However, someone who has dyslexia, theirs is on the opposing side. It's on the right, and it's not as active as I had stated before. Um, whenever you're trying to recall information, interpret information, and then spit it back out on a test or maybe even um, just to study. I have extra time to answer any questions about um, dyslexia and about how it's more than just a reading disability and about how it can affect people's lives. Um, believe it or not, dyslexia could make it be a very unsafe world for people because being a unable to memorize or um, navigate around without knowing your surroundings can, can be very at risk for those, those students, those adults, and it's always a struggle. They'll come up with coping strategies, but it's always ongoing. Are there any questions? Yes? Are there any effective treatments for dyslexia which are currently being developed? Yes, there are um, some treatments. A lot of them aren't um, like medications and stuff like that. It's just knowing those coping strategies. And teachers um, implement this a lot. Um, they can do repetition, as the first presenter was speaking of with Alexia. They're very, um, very similar. Repetition of different information can help them store the, that memory in the back of their brain. Um, having large text that is bolded on, um, on a piece of paper or on a, a smart board presentation will help them be able to just see those chunks. Because think about it yourself, if you have to read a, a big long paper with tiny words, you're kind of like, Oof, this is going to take a while. So imagine how those kids feel. So if you make the, that print enlarged and you kind of break it down, you have to just keep working through it like them. Anyone else have any more questions? Yes. I have come from the engineering side. Okay. And I've operated on three continents. Okay. And one of the things which I have observed, people give us a solution to an engineering problem and people with more experience mm -hmm. can look at the solution mm -hmm. and they said, and I have had experienced that many times, people said it came from the computer. Mm -hmm. I said, the number is wrong. Mm -hmm. Why do you say that? I said, I was brought up with a slide rule and I was also brought up without all the uh, calculators. Yes. We had to think, mm -hmm. and that really set apart mm -hmm. the students. Yeah, you could definitely be able to tell a difference if someone would have that. And, and moving into the business side, mm -hmm. what I have seen people just download information from the internet yes. and say, let me have your paper. Now explain to me the reason why you have selected this one over this one, and sometimes they have trouble doing that. Yes. 
how do we as instructors, professors, whatever title you give, right? how do we help these people to leave what I call the security blanket <laughs> and use your head which the load gave you? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I feel that um, those kids would depend on computers or other journals and other texts to rely on information because they themselves can't spit it back out. Um, but if you would allot extended time to complete an assignment, um, maybe offer them a guided note, maybe like a fill in the blank, um, it's, it is all dependent on the student themselves because people with dyslexia can be on the mild side versus the moderate side. So it, it all depends on the individual, but um, I would suggest just to allow extended time, <coughs> offer them some maybe one-on-one -on -one time with you and the student or with other students to work together because um, for them to do it on their own, they, they'll always revert back to, to finding someone else's information because they themselves can't um, remember and retrieve the information that they have taken in from someone else, like an educator. Does that have an impact on the structure uh, in the semester, separating between lecture time and exercise time? And exercise time as defined, adapt what you learned mm -hmm. to the problem I you. Yes, it would, it would definitely, uh, it would cause you to take more time for it to finally get completed and practice with it. That's all the time we have for questions. We need to move on to the next presenter. Thank you very much.